Yeah. Thank you, Andreas, for uh, the introduction. And um, we also want to extend our uh, thanks to the uh, Architecture Museum and everyone involved um, for inviting us. Um, we, are, we are very happy to be part of uh, the Future Architecture Platform Network uh, this year uh, because it gives us the chance to um, reflect on the project we will be showing to you um, in like different circumstances and today we'd like to do that um, with the outline which was given to us for the symposium. Uh, so we kind of went through um, reflecting again on that topic uh, under, the t under the umbrella of um, transformation. And there was one phrase uh, in, in the brief which stood out to us uh, because it kind of concerns a lot of the uh, parts of the, uh, the research we were doing, um, which says that an overwhelming part of construction uh, deals with the transformation of existing buildings and in that sense architecture is never really complete but always in a state of transformation. Um, so we will show to you that this is um, pretty true for uh, certain parts and certain details but in slight alterations uh, for, for our research. Um, generally when we are talking about uh, transformation architecture uh, it means actual physical uh, transformation. Uh, and especially political transformation always um, most likely goes along with uh, spatial and architectural uh, change. But in the case study that we will introduce to you today, um, structurally nothing has changed uh, since the year 1999, which is the year of the inauguration of uh, the building that we're going to show you in a little while. So it's a case apart that deals instead of transformation, the structure, with the transformation of the complexity in meaning that is associated with contested architectural heritage. Um, preservation uh, of heritage, in, in that sense, question of transformation usually deals with preserving the actual physical structure of architectural fragments, and we have rules for that, rules how we deal with these elements. Uh, but what we lack we would say, as um, guiding principles of how we can preserve or at least discuss the inscripted or the, the hidden, the underlying uh, meaning within architecture that in many cases relates to much broader and in most cases even political circumstances. So what we instead like to show with this lecture titled The Political Church is an attempt to broaden our understanding of contested heritage by seeing transformation as an integral part within the lifespan of architecture and not treating uh, structural problems or a decaying facade as something that is solvable, but something that rather needs attention. Um, the political church project therefore sees possibility in the varying nature of architecture's significance and a chance to instigate a new perception of contested sites and architecture. And in this, in this sense, it means not only to interpret this case study of the Cathedral Christ the Savior in Pristina as an obvious illustration of Serbian nationalism, but also as a readable object in the post-conflict debate about disputed architecture and to ask how we might deal with buildings in similar post-conflict situations, both on a uh, local level in uh, these countries, but also on a more global uh, scale. Um, the phrase, the political church, uh, actually is nothing that we uh, ourselves came up with. Uh, it's something that we actually took from an initial visit uh, or from the uh, initial visit to Pristina when we got a, a tour of the local campus where this church you see in the back uh, is uh, situated. And um, it was introduced to us as the sort of political manifestation uh, of Slobodan Milosevic regime and therefore uh, is the political church. And it was um, not necessarily, but also of course, the, this kind of ruined structure, which is, I mean, in its imposing way, very appealing, but more the, this side note of its political um, implication that uh, sparked a deeper interest about it. Um, so um, indeed this building was planned as a Serbian Orthodox uh, Church, as the Serbian Orthodox Church of Christ the Savior and um, was built during the times where, uh, like the conflictual times in Kosovo uh, in the mid-1990s when, uh, when 
like very when the very Slobodan Milosevic attempted to consolidate uh, Serbian control over the mainly ethnic Albanian uh, then province of Kosovo. Since then, the church was neither finished nor destroyed and remained structurally, at least me as we mentioned in the beginning, uh, in its uh, structural, but uh, in a very, and also, and that's very important to us, in a, a very meaning meaningful interim state. Um, for us, uh, the interesting point about that church is precisely that interim state, uh, a state that records um, a political condition. Like no other pr uh, building in Pristina, the church symbolizes the one, on one hand the retreat of the Serbian forces uh, from the city and uh, the time when construction halted back in the 90s. Therefore, it's also the time um, of the fall of the Milosevic regime. So this temporary state uh, is a temporary state lasting in architecture. Um, a state, however, uh, and that's what you know, our, re our research is concerned about, is that the state changes with the changing perceptions of that building. Um, you see here the uh, inauguration uh, ceremony from uh, January 27, 1999, and uh, this is a recent photo uh, we, uh, which was done by the photographer duo we are working with um, uh, recently. Um, so you see, not structurally, nothing has changed, but. Um, uh, by the time of its construction in 1995, the uh, Albanian population had been gradually pushed out of Pristina city center, which you see here. This is the campus area, um, and by the time uh, of the end of the war, this very campus, which they knew as campus before, had been uh, completely transformed um, by uh, the church building. And this spatial violence um, of this trans transformation has been passed on to today. To illustrate this, uh, um, I'm going to show two master plans. One on the left side is from Bashkim Fimiu, uh, a, a Albanian architect who um, thought of this space you just saw in this uh, aerial view as um, a space of knowledge uh, and not belief. And um, the master plan on the right side is the 1989 master plan, which kind of completely uh, transforms the idea of um, the, the, this, this campus as a campus area and puts uh, a church in the middle of this, of this campus, um, which cuts through the former function. So um, this, the final design for that church, based on that master plan, uh, was a winning entry to uh, following 1991 competition. Um, by the Serbian architect Slasoje uh, Krunic, and uh, it was part of a wider program of building religious site within Kosovo to, um, to assert uh, the Serbian dominance in the region. Um, if this church had been completed, 1,389 uh, golden crosses would have been uh, engraved into the natural stone facade, and this is a very important number uh, because the year 1389 uh, being, is being the battle uh, of the year that the Battle of Kosovo took place, uh, which was much mythologized by uh, Serbian nationalists. Um, you see here uh, on the left side uh, Milosevic um, in his uh, very famous 1989 uh, speech invoking this battle uh, 600 years ago, and on the right side, uh, and this, is, this became kind of like an essential uh, core of how we conducted research about that church, which, you know, information was sparse about, is a, a wall section uh, drawn by the architect of the church, which I interviewed. Um, and uh, in lack of uh, communication skills, uh, my Serbian is, of course, very bad, and his English was also bad. So we had sort of like a drawn interview where he uh, revealed to me that this number would have been imposed on um, the outer structure. So this is very important to it. Um, today, um, this structure remains in uh, its kind of ambiguous um, state and um, is just passed by hundreds of students every day without uh, paying really attention to it. 
Um, for several years now, there is a, a dispute between the Serbian Orthodox Church uh, and the local university, the University of Pristina, about the affiliation, uh, who, does, who owns that church, basically, who owns that space. Uh, and instead of offering a solution for the future of this architecture, um, the ongoing debate about it kind of seems to solidify um, the structure's temporary state as a permanent one. Um, so, our research therefore um, focuses on a, let's say, cross-disciplinary approach to not only uh, investigating this building, but to contested heritage uh, in general as a necessary tool for the productive examination of uh, sites like this. Um, in this case, for example, uh, information about Pristina's inner center from the 90s is very <coughs> rare, scarce, it's hard to get by. So this case study was primarily set out to provide basic sources of information and foster the awareness for how contested spaces similar to this could be approached collectively. Um, what we wanted is to initiate a detailed understanding of the transformative forces behind this ruined shell um, and therefore we focused on connecting existing narratives around the political church from uh, the position of an uninvited outsider, um, that instead of taking sides, which is what everybody does who is involved with this site every day, um, tries to connect various opinions. Uh, sometimes we think it's a good idea to have an outside view to come in uh, and research uh, projects like this. Um, and all these different opinions and the tendencies that we collected and the uh, discussions that we had uh, are then reflected in a series of interviews, a film, photos, spatial speculations in both text and drawing, um, which in the end uh, draw a comprehensible map of the actual complexity behind the architecture in the church. Um, in one word, what we're interested in more than the structure uh, is the story behind it. Um, so the aim ultimately is to open a much broader debate about how we might interact with an unwanted, politically charged building, suggesting a change towards a more active and continuous discourse, both legal, architectural and political. Um, you see here's an, uh, it's a photo from the inside of the building. It's hard to see because it's rather dark on the projection, but in the upper right hand corner you see these uh, sc scorch marks um, from uh, um, from uh, grenades going off or little bombs going off inside the church. So these narratives uh, coalesce in the ruined cathedral of Christ the Savior. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a readable site uh, that's uh, shown here in the picture, I guess. Um, and uh, this church has been the central element of a dialectic process of violence both aimed against its architecture on the one hand and also the symbolic spatial violence that originates from the construction of the church itself. So the unfinished church not only uh, then embodies past political decisions and the misuse of power, but is it, it is at the same time a projection screen for and a bone of contention in contemporary politics and also in society in the area uh, from which the development of a collective identity as well as a collective hatred could be read. Um, and in that sense, I guess the, the church uh, has been the backdrop for political uh, demonstrations over the past uh, years or decades, um, sometimes arguing uh, for the destruction of the church um, or for critical art installations, um, sometimes even arguing uh, to turning uh, it over into a site of uh, temporary squatting. Um, in any case, the church ruin and its immediate surrounding has already been repurposed, transformed, if you will, countless times, even though structure, structurally nothing has changed. Um, one observation in particular stood out to us, and that is that um, where originally um, mighty oaks should have guided uh, the visitor towards the entrance of the church, um, K4 soldiers, during the war uh, put up a solid barbed wire fence in a 50 meter radius around the church. Um, 
That is a radius that was drawn around Serbian sites after the end of the war to protect them against revenge attacks. And um, this is what it looks like. And to assess this virtual zone, uh, we've engaged in a visual conversation with uh, the photographers that were already mentioned, uh, named Schmott, that's Matthias Schmidt and Michael Ott, uh, two photographers based in Frankfurt. Um, so we engaged in a visual conversation with them about visual hints on spatial manifestations, uh, trying to unravel the multi-layered and conflictual character of the ruin. Um, this photo series uh, with the title 50 meters uh, investigates this informal radius of the site surrounding the ruined cathedral without necessarily, and that's important, bound, uh, being bound to the established tools of architects. Um, the, the view, the gaze of the photographer is a completely different one uh, than the one of an architect. Um, and within this perimeter then, uh, and I guess that's the architectural statement, uh, we see a speculative uh, arena for a vital critical debate that discusses the ruins' own future as well as the question of collective remembrance. And then at, on the other hand, of course, we are very well aware that um, addressing questions to contested architectural heritage, and especially in this case, uh, can be a very tricky endeavor um, that demands a great amount of sensibility. Um, because all creative proposals for a structural uh, renewal of uh, the church um, must become very problematic, um, at least once this architecture, besides already having difficult history, is identified as uh, the site of a suspected mass grave. Um, there was an excavation in 2016 uh, that was looking within this radius uh, for the still missing victims of the war uh, of 1999. So uh, in this aerial view, uh, you see again how around the church, within that 50 meter radius, uh, the site has changed between 2003 and 2013, um, even though the building itself remained the same. Its meaning uh, changed, uh, inscribed in the landscape surrounding it. Um, so our approach sees possibility in the continuous alteration of the church's meaning. We see this as a chance to instigate a new perception of a political church. It shows the importance of research that carefully examines spatial formations and transformations. So um, all these kind of details, which are sort of new details and kind of, um, sh I would say like, like, yeah, new added details in and around the church, like the pigeons you see, which are reusing, which are the actual ones who are reusing the space. Um, kind of become uh, the new equivalents of the original plant uh, structure and these fragments and imprints could be um, much more uh, mu could be much more important than um, the actual building itself so instead of um, solidifying um, this ruined architecture in Pristina uh, uh, as a gridlock monument, as a sort of dark reminder, um, we rather seek to kind of open, find ways to open up uh, um, its discursive impact. And um, we would like to use this uh, political uh, cathedral, if you want so, as a tool to translate, uh, decrypt, and mitigate, uh, and most of all, understand uh, the multi layered um, conflicts behind it. So, um, to enable the rune as such an initiator of a lasting public debate, it needs a medium of translation that uh, shows um, the path of influences on its architecture and uh, their results in an understandable language. Uh, our focus, and it, I think this is very important, lies not necessarily uh, on solving the legal conflict, of course. Uh, um, this, is, this is not our competence as uh, architects, but also not its structural future. And I think this is, this is um, yeah, very important to us. Um, because um, the ambition here is merely to create an accessible and understandable narrative um, that basically describes the current uh, state of that uh, architecture. Um, questions like how could we formulate an intervention in that place? Uh, is there a possibility of transformation at all? Um, 
that would come after that process of actually providing first-hand information, um, of what we did with the initial approach to um, that, uh, that spatial formation. So coming back maybe to what we uh, quoted earlier from the uh, brief for the symposium, uh, I think we would agree that architecture is not only about building a new, but we would like to add that maybe, sometimes, uh, it's not about building at all. Um, so it's important to us that we do not necessarily try to develop new architectural solutions for this church, but instead we focus on the description of the current state. The aim is to approach this case study that lingers between coexistence and conflict uh, in an unbiased way and uh, from the position, as I said, uh, as an uninvited outsider so that we might possibly uh, ask unorthodox questions uh, that open a vital debate in the first place. Um, this, we believe, um, in the end, might open up a much broader perspective on contested spaces that instead of transforming architectural heritage physically, uh, generates a basis for negotiation that sees meaningful transformation in the visual visualization uh, of the conflictual complexity behind difficult architecture. Um, a complexity that in other cases uh, had already caused desperate solutions and uh, we'd like to draw your uh, attention to uh, an example from where we from the city where we both studied and where I still live, uh, the city of Weimar, uh, which is a small town of 60,000 people in the middle of Germany. And uh, it is also the place where um, the first and actually only fully realized Gau Forum um, stands till today. The Gau Forum is uh, basically a capital city within the regional um, um, administrative system of the Nazi uh, Reich. So um, for this structure, an entire residential um, uh, neighborhood or quarter uh, needed uh, to go. Um, and that in favor of a marching ground and a vast array of governmental buildings uh, that are uh, also topped uh, by a very imposing structure that you see on the upper left, which is the Halle der Volksgemeinschaft, um, a uh, congress or assembly hall. Um, it's a space of such magnitude that traditional means of architectural engagement don't seem to apply easily in negotiating its future form. Um, and what happened here um, a couple years ago is uh, that after being derelict and in uh, a state of decay uh, for a couple of years, uh, this building has been transformed now into a shopping mall. Um, there's uh, an ambition to see in this image uh, to make this outer space, this marching area where uh, Nazis used to uh, come together, um, is made inaccessible by, uh, it's hard to see, but uh, this here is actually like a, it's like a ditch um, so that you cannot step foot on the grass. So you see the ambition to uh, not let this area within the city fall you know, to certain groups of people. But then on the other hand, there's such a ridiculous uh, use uh, on the inside. Uh, there's this Venetian village. And um, I guess what we're arguing now is not to say this is not good architecture. That's not so important to us. What's more important is that it was possible to you know, come to such an easy conclusion that we need shopping space and we should do it there. Um, and we believe that one of the reasons is that the material that discusses the entire history of the building has not been properly made available to the entire uh, population of the city. Um, this image is quite important actually because you see those load be these beams uh, on top. Uh, they need to remain visible because there was a, a call from the Heritage Preservation Department because they are made from concrete and not from steel. The reason being that by the end of the war, uh, Germany ran out of steel. So uh, they, they are built completely from concrete and it's very unique. And so um, even though I guess uh, the people run, running this place would have liked a continuous uh, starlight ceiling, um, they need to show this. And this, I guess, um, shows a little bit of the history of the building, but nobody knows about it. And I think uh, coming back to our original starting point, uh, this is what we as architects also have the responsibility to do, is to educate people about the stories behind the structure. So starting with uh, the case study of the church in Pristina, we see the potential for an ongoing critical spatial approach 
in other contexts as well uh, that might even develop into an archive of contested political heritage both in Europe and beyond. Um, this production of knowledge about objects and the processes they inform is, uh, I guess, done in two steps. First, the comprehensive research and collection of information as well as, as its documentation and dissemination, which can lead to conferences, uh, can lead to publications and exhibitions. And secondly, the discussion, the evaluation and further development of these findings uh, in a fitting setting. Uh, with, which could be a workshop format with, uh, with uh, the public body of the city. So by linking various sides of unwanted, politically charged or differently contested architecture and spaces, we would like to encourage a shift towards an active and continuous form of exchange. We'd like to foster a broader awareness of what actually makes buildings political and what role architecture itself plays within the process of the transformation of spaces. So all in all, and that's the wrapping up sentence, um, the political church should serve as a mod model or a mode of thought that frames a joint approach to contested sites which need diverse and sometimes even experimental guiding principles for how we deal with them apart from seeing their fate as physically solvable.